Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special edition entitled The Carnicom Disclosure Project and produced by Transparent Media Truth. This initial video was utilized by Clifford Carnicom for a series of roundtable discussions involving experts from a variety of fields interested in exploring Clifford's work with the potential for future collaboration. These discussions were produced on November 4th and 5th, 2020, and will be posted at a later date. But we at Transparent Media Truth want to offer this introductory video to all those interested in the work of Clifford Carnicom and the Carnicom Institute. The video outlines a brief history of his research into the origins and potential causes of Morgellons disease, a strange skin rash accompanied by the presence of a polymer-like protrusion from the dermis, as well as other symptoms described here in greater detail. While the mainstream would have us believe that these symptoms are psychosomatic, Research produced at the Carnicom Institute over nearly two decades clearly shows the presence of a new and diagnosable disease that is currently affecting thousands and potentially tens of thousands of people worldwide. As you will see in the video, Clifford has managed to isolate what he describes as a cross-domain bacteria, which he believes is the main cause of the issue. This unique organism is novel in nature and appears to contain characteristics of both a bacteria and a fungus. Once embedded, this bacteria multiplies, producing, in sum, a fibrous network of a wire-like substance that is yet to be tested by the FDA, CDC, or any other federal agency. Perhaps most concerning is the fact that this bacteria appears to be ubiquitous within the environment worldwide and is suspected to be spread via aerosol spraying covering vast swaths of the population. For more information, check out the 72-page document that will be published in the show notes attached to this video, or go to the Carnicom Institute website for access to the over 300 research papers pertaining to this issue. Clifford is seeking to expand and codify his work, as well as make it available in perpetuity through the creation of the Carnicom Foundation. Though the Institute has, with limited resources, managed to isolate the DNA of this novel organism, it currently lacks the capability to engage in the expensive testing required to sequence it in order to better understand its characteristics and potential function. The purpose of this disclosure is both to educate the public as well as to seek potential professionals interested in taking this research to the next level. Please stay tuned for the release of the two roundtable discussions produced by Transparent Media Truth, consisting of Clifford with other experts analyzing his findings in greater detail. To find out more about Clifford's work or to make a donation to the Carnicom Institute, please go to carnicominstitute.org. I am your host. My name is Doug McKenty. Find out more about my weekly podcast, The Shift with Doug McKenty, at theshiftnow.com. I'd also like to thank Rob Rubin at Transparent Media Truth for his diligent work of putting this together. You can find him on Twitter at TransparentMED1 or go to www.transparentmediatruth.com for this and all other videos produced to date. If you like what you're hearing, please like, subscribe, and share this podcast as, in the age of big tech shadow banning, we rely on listeners like you to distribute these ideas. Please enjoy this video produced by Clifford Carnicom and the Carnicom Disclosure Project. Greetings. My name is Clifford E. Carnicom. I'm the president of the Carnicom Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to environmental and health education and research. The work of the Institute has been in place and progress for about 22 years now. About half of that time was uh, done uh, as an individual and the latter half done under the uh, nonprofit status. I wish to thank each of you for being here today. I know that we have a very distinguished uh, group here and I appreciate the skill set that is here, the experience base and the judgment qualities that are uh, apparent within each of you. I wish to um, talk to you today about what is being called the Carnicom Institute Disclosure Project. And I'll be fairly brief with my time to compress 22 years into 40 minutes is impossible for me. I'm going to try to compress two to three years into 40 minutes, which is actually still impossible for me. Um, but I'd like to uh, 
mentioned the objectives of the meeting. They are fivefold here. And um, then I will also, of these five purposes, I will go through the first two segments before we would actually get to the information release. So I need to get a screen share started here. So let's see if we can get that going. There we go. Here they are the objectives that I have. The first is that there is some information that I would like to speak about. The majority of this information uh, has developed over the last two years of the nonprofit's existence. The vast majority of this work is not published uh, for, for a variety of reasons. And there is a process uh, taking place of a turnover of all information in all respects of the Institute over to the public domain. And I'm asking uh, the individuals that are here to, I guess, uh, serve two goals. One would be just uh, to simply act as a witness uh, to the release of this information. And then the second would be to hopefully act as a bridge of communication to the public. There are some things that are a little bit more technical in nature and a little bit more difficult for some people to understand. And so I'm asking for your help in that fashion, if you're willing. But if nothing else, I would like this information to be released in what I would call a controlled fashion to those that I regard as responsible individuals that can um, uh, both comprehend as as well as make decisions as to how the information is best distributed to the general uh, public. I am hoping that we have representation at, at, at several levels of professions. Really, most all professions are welcome in this project, uh, particular emphasis upon health, science, uh, legal, and journalism would certainly be uh, beneficial if we are so fortunate. Number three is extremely important and a big part of the reason why I am here. With the information that I will be um, uh, speaking of, there is potential harm to the public uh, if the information is misunderstood, misused, uh, inappropriately distributed. Um, there is a potential of uh, health harm uh, to individuals and it's, I feel it's my duty and responsibility uh, to release this information to those that have the, uh, really the experience base to understand that information and again can serve as a uh, bridge to the public and also be of service to them uh, in the future. Uh, there is, of course, the majority of the uh, project is specific information that I would like you to each be aware of uh, that it does exist and also where to find this information, again, because it is unpublished. There are also some issues of liability that could um, arise here. And so um, I also wish to, to um, uh, strike a balance between uh, letting it be known that there are certain legal issues that affect the public uh, the public may not be fully aware of them. Uh, and I also have some uh, legal responsibilities. Uh, but paramount to all, in the end, the issue here is the right of the public to know and to have access uh, to all information. And particularly on the harm issue, potential harm, I do not wish for anyone uh, to be subject to any uh, liability of any kind. So I think a public disclosure under a controlled environment is the best way that I can accomplish that. The second thing I want to speak of is what would be helpful. And that is an attempt at least was certainly made to make uh, each of you aware of a document. It is a 72 page document. Um, that 72 page document is probably the most uh, succinct uh, uh, history of topics of research of the Institute that exists. 
That transcript is of a presentation that I gave in Santa Fe, New Mexico in April of 2019. I simply will not have time to go over the material in that document. What we're speaking of today will be, again, the latter two years of unpublished work primarily. This document that I'm speaking of, this transcript of this presentation, is a document that covers uh, really all published work uh, prior to the last two years. It would be extremely beneficial if you have been able uh, to familiarize yourself uh, with that document, at least at some general level, as to the types of topics that are included in it. Under Underlying that 72-page document are at least 350 research papers over the last 20 years, and they probably amount to two or 2,000 to 3,000 pages of material uh, of published work. So I understand that we can't be familiar at that level at this time. So my goal is to let you know that the material exists and where to get it. But the transcript document would be particularly beneficial because we simply will not have time uh, to cover that material or even answer our questions about it particularly. And with that, that's uh, really all that I would like to speak of right now. And then we will go into the actual information, which will be uh, very specific. And I will do my best to be as brief and concise as possible. I'd like to continue by getting into some of the information of concern uh, in this presentation. But before I do so, I would like to sort of set the stage as to what has um, what has transpired in the past to bring about the situation where we even need to have this meeting and why we're here. I'm going to shift to the screen and uh, show you a couple of slides and we'll step through them and then we'll start talking about some specific information from it. So let's see if I can get the... Uh, screen share working for us. It's a little bit of a delay here, apparently. Okay. There are four governmental agencies that have basically imposed a major injustice upon those of this country and has the effect of actually uh, impacting the entire world. Um, I'll stay out of the uh, networking level with other countries at this point because the United States government is sufficient to make the point. Um, briefly, I'm going to go through these uh, four agencies and the major offense committed by each of them uh, that has uh, in large part led to the situation that we're in today. The first is the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, this interaction dates back to 1999 when a very unusual uh, filament sample uh, collected from the environment was delivered uh, to them under certified mail with a request for an identification of that material as it was um, perceived by myself and, and others to be a hazard to the environment and that it was necessary and appropriate to know the nature of that material. I don't have a lot of time to go over the details of this. Everything that I speak of um, has been written up, up to now and what we're talking about now has been written into papers. So the research papers are there. But briefly, the, the EPA refused to identify that material. They, they also sat on that material for a year and a half. Uh, before they um, responded. And when they did respond, it was because of a Freedom of Information Act filed by a third party that had no relation actually to my work. That was another motive involved. Um, but in response to that FOIA, after a year and a half, they did re, uh, uh, finally write back and, and basically said, it's not our responsibility to examine this material unless we ask for it. Um, I view that as a major legal issue uh, that has never been served uh, properly since that time of 1999. 
uh, and, and has consequences. That particular issue has consequences to bring us into the meeting we're in today. Second being the United States Air Force. The United States Air Force, in the uh, face of increasing and overwhelming evidence that uh, significant uh, environmental changes were taking in the place, aircraft were involved, are involved. And the United States Air Force put forth a, a statement, a position that the entire issue and concern here by however many people are, are off, you know, are asking for an investigation. They designated that body of evidence and that concern as, quote, a hoax. Uh, now, it is of interest that the front man or the individual that um, um, made that statement, if you look into it, I didn't discover it till years afterwards. But the person making that statement was a master intelligence officer uh, that publicly was presenting himself as a, a liaison officer uh, for communication to the public. So, uh, you know, I don't have time to debate uh, the uh, innuendos and uh, effects of each of these, but uh, everyone can conclude, conclude for myself. I regard that as a major uh, uh, offense upon the American people. Third, Centers for Disease Control. There is a health condition. We will talk, at, talk about it more as we go along. A name given to it is that of Morgellons. The Centers for Disease Control did formally get involved with this um, issue at one point and purported to conduct a scientific study of the issue. The offense is that the study conducted by the Centers for Disease Control was not of a scientific nature, at least that which would standard, uh, satisfy the standards of what I would call uh, any of the peer-reviewed uh, approaches. There was a very much a lack of specific information in this uh, report, uh, which I read, at least the information that was publicly released that I had access to. And it basically, the study was a character assassination upon the people that participated in it and did not objectively actually study uh, the, the evidence that was there. Major example given that the CDC says in their study they identify a protein. We will be talking about a protein uh, quite a bit uh, as we go along and have in the, in the transcript I've referred you to. But they gave no specific information about that protein and specific information about that protein should have been the heart of their study as opposed to uh, basically... Uh, uh, maligning people and, and making an inference that those that were participating in the study were psychologically unstable, had, um, you know, uh, behavioral problems and drinking problems or drug problems, uh, when one will find that the demographics of an objective study, which this, this organization uh, did conduct, does not show that demographic whatsoever. In fact, it shows an educated, rather health conscientious individual uh, as, as a primary demographic representative. The fourth is the um, United States Patent Office. And I am going to read a statement here. I, I will not, I read this statement, it presented a statement at a uh, conference in Tucson, I think about uh, two years ago now. And I have to be somewhat careful in terms of what I say. So I wrote it down. I'm going to read this to you. And it is number four. And it is very much um, a part of why we are here today, actions that were taken or were not taken by the United States Patent Office. I'll read it fairly quickly, and then you can find this uh, later within the transcript document I gave you. It is now appropriate to disclose that the fourth entity involves the following. And this is referring, the fourth entity is referring to the United States Pat Patent Office. This will be basically the circle right here. Involves the following. A, an abuse and misappropriation of intellectual property developed by myself. This intellectual property has the potential to benefit the lot of mankind. B, the obfuscation of information disclosure involves the U.S. Patent Office, certain lawyers, and certain parties in the professional health and research fields. A patent application in my name, this would be me, 
A patent application in my name on the issue of Morgellons has been released to the public, but it is essentially expired due to the above state of affairs. And a claim has been made by certain parties mentioned above that the issue of Morgellons is delusional as based upon peer-reviewed literature and that lab evidence does not exist. Proper legal procedures for the protection of my interest in intellectual property would have been and are required to refute these claims. The net effect is that the injustice here is inhibiting the access of the public to scientific knowledge and the benefit of significant health-related research that has taken place. The best hint that I can give you at this time is you will need to engage yourself in the background notes of my research and with the Legacy Project Foundation. I'll explain more about that later, and we shall. It may also be wise to begin investigating investigating the methods such as the Freedom of Information Act and legal discovery. This is what can be disclosed at this time. I can say no more at this time, but I want this on the record for you. And this remains the case, and I really cannot go further with that statement without having some type of legal support or representation, but I'm trying to let you know that we have a very significant accumulation and and evolution of obfuscation that has taken place involving uh, really the highest level uh, government agencies regarding access to and disclosure of scientific information. And this does bring us um, uh, to this meeting. And the transcript that I mentioned to you is extremely important because it, it shows that chronology and evolution that has uh, caused this meeting to take place. This now brings us to a, a significant aspect of the uh, disclosure part of this project. And what I'm going to do now is uh, show you a series of claims that are made by the Kernicom Institute. I'll take my time reading them. I won't have time to discuss these within this particular presentation, um, but uh, hopefully the question and answer period may prompt some discussion on them. But I will go through these uh, claims of the Carnegie Institute as based upon 20 some years of research. Let's see if I can get this uh, screen share going. Okay, and I think that takes a second or so uh, to get up on the screen. So I'll wait for that and hopefully we're in business now. Claims of Carnicom Institute, again, based on two decades plus of research. Number one, the identification and existence of a unique microbial life form has been established by Carnicom Institute. Number two, this microbe is of high biological impact across the globe with known significant toxicity and consequent pathology. Number three, one source for the existence of this microbe is a unique environmental filament form that the United States Environmental Protection Agency has refused to investigate or identify. We may recall that this dates back to 1999. Number four, there is no organism known to date that is immune to the presence or effects of the microbe. Humans, including children, animals and plants have each demonstrated detrimental effects. The entire human race, statistically speaking, appears to be either vulnerable or subject to influence from the microbe. Number five, there will be 14 of these. Number five, specific and identifiable symptoms from the microbe upon humans have been identified from objective survey data gathered by Carnicom Institute. Internal biological impact to a degree has also 
been established. Number six, cross-domain bacteria nomenclature has been tentatively assigned to the microbe due to assessments that indicate the span of biological domains across its life cycle. That, of course, is deserving of more discussion. Number seven, the microbe can now be cultured efficiently, misspelling there, can be cultured efficiently and repeatedly under controlled conditions. Number eight, a basic separation of fundamental biomolecules of the microbe, including that of proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids has been accomplished. Number nine, significant knowledge of the nature of various protein constituents of the microbe has been acquired, particularly with respect to the use of infrared spectrometry and chromatography. Number 10, toxicity studies that subject microbial life, fungi, and various plants to one of the proteinaceous forms have been conducted. The results are alarming. Number 11, DNA has been extracted on numerous occasions from the microbial cultures and the process is repeatable. Identification of the nature of the DNA will require an audit process. Legal support for testing demands is likely to be required. Number 12, certain mitigating strategies from a research position only to the harmful effects of the microbe are proffered by Carnicum Institute. Such strategies are informational only and are not of a diagnostic or therapeutic nature. Number 13, the existence of the microbe and the effects upon the biology of this planet, including humans, is not formally acknowledged or accepted at this time. Any purported governmental studies or peer accepted literature on the nature of this situation remain inadequate or misdirected at this time. Number 14, documentation for the above claims resides within the Library of Research of Carnicum Institute. Significant intellectual property within those documents has now been released to the general public in hopes that progress for current and future generations will ensue. This is the substance in large part of disclosure of this particular meeting to this group of individuals uh, specifically and purposefully. I do think that there will be uh, considerable grounds for thought as well as this discussion as to the claims that are being made here. Many uh, or several at least of these claims have been made publicly in the past. The difference at this time uh, particularly relates to both number 12 and number 14. At this stage, an emphasis upon number 14. There are a series of documents, particularly uh, the laboratory notebooks. Um, a set of 25 notebooks have been released, and um, these notebooks, they never were intended to be released. Uh, they have been released primarily because um, of the state of affairs with, with respect to the uh, Tucson statement that I read to you 
uh, some time ago, uh, which uh, began to involve uh, certain health professionals, uh, certain lawyers, and the U.S. Patent Office. It is a result of that particular situation that has led me to uh, release the entire library, including my laboratory notebooks, which is basically the record of the actual work that substantiates these claims. The research paper is on file, roughly 350 are certainly a part of this process, but behind that work of the research papers, there was another level of work taking place, and that was the recording of my work, uh, at least for a significant portion of it when they started. 20, 25 volumes, roughly 4,000 pages of material have been released. And uh, with that, I'm going to end this segment I will have a, another segment relating to number 12, more strongly, on certain mitigating strategies. And then after that, I'd like to show, uh, show you how to access or where to access uh, the documentation that I'm speaking of. Uh, and then we'll open this up for some discussions. So thank you very much. This now brings us to the second uh, important uh, portion of discussion and disclosure. And what I'm going to be speaking about is uh, some of the health effects uh, of this particular microbe and also and associated health conditions from it and also some potential mitigating strategies that are in place. So I'm going to go to the screen share again. We have a couple slides that we're going to uh, work through. We'll see if I can get this uh, running for you. Okay, again, that might take a second to come up, but hopefully you'll see it. So the first segment will be on uh, health aspects, and the second section will be on uh, mitigation approaches. Okay, to get this started, uh, I'll start at a casual level first, and that is if any of you were to see the correspondence uh, from people across the world that I have witnessed over the last uh, 20 years um, describing their health circumstances that they are facing and the lack of support and literally assistance from the health communities of being shunned from the health communities. And you're going to hear the word delusional uh, a few times as we probably go along here. Uh, it's actually, it's just heartbreaking. It's hard to imagine. And this is one thing I have not released is the uh, correspondence, both correspondence as well as some legal documents that could be of importance over time. Uh, but that record of correspondence is it's just overwhelming. And as another example of the type of thing that I have to face and have no means to deal with is the fact that I have probably at least a dozen people. These are just citizens from anywhere that they're, they are completely down and out in terms of not being able to get any assistance on the condition of their health, which they attribute to a, uh, a repeatable set of symptoms, something that is shared by other people. And they have offered their bodies to me. They're dying. They know they're on their last days and they're offering their bodies to me for research to try and learn what I can to help other people. Now, I'm sorry, but it's pathetic because such a situation should never be occurring where a, a, a person and not one, mind you, numerous people have been in this position of approaching a small nonprofit, uh, un, unfunded or underfunded organization and asking them to basically uh, form a, an analysis of a cadaver. So that's on the casual side. That's the real world that I deal with on a daily basis in terms of communication over the years. Now, since I'm a person 
that presents my work primarily from an evidentiary standpoint. Let's start going to some of the harder information, which will support the heartbreaking condition that many people find themselves in. The first will be that the Carnicom Institute did conduct conduct a survey. It was an objective survey. It was fairly done and it well it was well done and honestly done. And that survey involved roughly a thousand people from across the world. And there is so much information from that survey that has never been reviewed. Uh, it's just there's hundreds and hundreds of pages. And I could say thousands again, I'm sure, of pages of data that was collected. Let me see if I can get the um, results of that. Now, this is information that is not anecdotal. This is from a, a an honest survey, and you can look up this project uh, on the site. It's all there. This is a summary statement of those thousands of pages of material about what people are experiencing. I won't have time to go through them all. The reports are all there for you to read if you wish. But you can certainly see some things that are happening. This, this is roughly the top uh, 20 percentile of symptoms that are appearing across different systems of the body. Is it, uh, it was arranged in that kind of way. So let's at least try to group some of these. In the first three or four, you're, you're talking about skin conditions. There are people, you have over well over 1,000 people uh, that are participated. They have a repeating set of symptoms involving skin conditions, enough to attract your attention. Keep going, let's get some other things here. Their vision is being affected. Uh, they have uh, ringing ears. Tinnitus has come up early in the game on this, so being a, a, a symptom. Dental conditions. Uh, I can attest to you from personal experience uh, that this one is quite true. I just had a lady write to me uh, yesterday who has lost her hip. There is bone destruction. There's a reason for that, by the way. Phosphoric acid is a strong uh, component of one of these uh, proteins. Uh, fatigue. If you look at this, six different sections of the survey, meaning six different areas um, approaching the body, reported fatigue. It's obviously an, an extremely present symptom in the set. Shortness of breath. Uh, mucus, stiffness in joints, constipation, unusual weight gain, bloating, uh, anxiety, headaches. Forget. Okay, your next set there at the end as we finish this. Um, a whole set of cognitive issues coming up, right, involving memory, particularly short-term memory. And many of us laugh about that. Uh, at least we try to make a game out of it. But uh, don't be surprised if uh, you have a source for some of these issues. Now, you may ask yourself whether or not uh, you as an individual may be experiencing any of these symptoms and whether or not it might uh, pique your interest as to what the source of some of those symptoms may be. I would say it's more than deserving of your attention. Let's go back. And I've got to get through this, so we've got to carry on. Okay, so we're stepping through this. There's another set of symptoms that I'm certainly aware of from uh, laboratory analysis and research, and I'll list them. Uh, each of these is of huge importance, great impact, but I won't have time to go through them all, but it's another set of uh, symptoms that are a little bit deeper into the research and justified through laboratory methods. So step one, physical samples readily abundant. The samples are there if we wish to um, if we wish to examine them, there are plenty of physical samples that are readily abundant. There is a major issue going on with disruption of the blood and iron in the blood and oxidation of the blood. I wrote many, many years ago uh, about one of, one of the first primary discoveries was the change in the oxidation state of the iron. Now, your blood doesn't work unless the iron is in the correct chemical state, what's called the oxidation state. This organism, clearly from numerous studies and analysis and straight culture analysis, disrupts and alters that state of oxidation in the blood. What that means is the blood, the iron can no longer bind to oxygen at the level that it needs to. And I'll, I'll give you this uh, a single statement that I've, uh, another one of the axioms that's out there in, in biology, okay? 
And that is that respiration is a source of all energy. If you screw up the respiratory process, you are disrupting and damaging the entire energy cycle in your body. Recall the, recall the presence of fatigue. You have something immediately to be looking at. Blood alterations, destructive or transformational. I'm going to show you a couple slides very quickly to show you the, the types of things that these are not anomalies. These are more common than uh, most of us would ever like to imagine. I'm going to show you some pictures of blood to show you the variation uh, that's taking place. I will say this. It's a, it is a fact that I have not, and I'm not a doctor. That's going to be uh, made quite clear in all the statements. It is in all the papers. I'm not offering any diagnostic, no therapeutic uh, intentions motives here whatsoever. It's strictly informational. Okay? But I, I have seen, put it this way, I have not seen a single individual at this point that does not show some mark of this particular microbe in the blood or in the body somewhere. Now, I'm not going to debate the semantics or the statistics of it, but I will tell you that that is a fact. And you'll see my statements as they can be uh, correctly made. But that is that is a statement of fact. I have not witnessed a single individual at this time that's willing uh, to provide, um, you know, a observation for me that does not show the mark of this microbe in the blood. Now, three comparisons here. This blood is actually, uh, I would consider it a control reference. And, and I'm saying some mark, okay? There's many different ways of detecting the presence of this micro, but any bodily fluid is uh, one of your easiest ways to go at it. You could consider this as a, uh, quote, control or normal um, uh, blood slide, not, not bad relative to the other things you see. This next one here, this, is, this would be more typical of the type of situation that can easily arise. The microbe that we're speaking of is is basically it's lining the blood cell now when it when it gets uh, more serious it will actually uh, break apart the cell it will disrupt the cell and es essentially destroy the ability of that cell to function this is a moderate state i guess i would say relative to things that i've seen i don't have time to go over all the slides but what we're, the actual microbe measures are roughly about a half a micron in diameter uh, somewhere in there could be down three tenths it doesn't look like it's eight tenths Five tenths is a reasonable number, and it, uh, a blood cell is eight microns across. You can see that it works on the perimeter of the cell to start, and eventually it will get inside that cell and it will disrupt it. Now, this last uh, uh, photograph, this truly is uh, anomalous in the, in the most extraordinary way. And I wrote a paper on this. It's called Transformation of a Species. It opens up many, many questions uh, because in most cases when the blood is severely um, affected the blood cells are uh, the integrity of the cell is lost it's broken it's dismantled and the cells are obviously not able to function this is an extraordinary case where the the cellular uh, perimeter is actually still intact but nevertheless it's absolutely completely infested and overloaded with the micro these structures are not supposed to be here uh, this is extraordinary in terms of the, what you would call the packing and the geometry of what's actually going on here. This is not typical. This is an extraordinary situation that deserved its own paper uh, roughly about a year year ago. Okay, So this is not typical, but it shows you what can happen and it raises uh, just absolutely fascinating questions of how you could have a situation where one person, the blood is being uh, completely dis destroyed essentially to, in its ability to function. In another case, you have this high geometric arrangement uh, coming coming forth. Um, so those are some examples of the way the blood can be impacted. Uh, let's get back to this list. I got to get through these. Uh, hypothyroidism, low body temperature, one of the easiest things in the world to uh, use as a signal indicator. Do a little bit of research and, and do a statistical study of how many people have a low body temperature right now. Um, also do a little bit of examination as to if anyone's really even looking into that. Uh, you have these things called the new normal, these phrases called the new normal. Well, low body temperature is one of your first indications. Here's another action for you in uh, biology and chemistry. 
Every chemical reaction takes place at a specific temperature and specific pH. You, you alter either one of those and you interfere with the ability of that chemical reaction to take place. All right. Now think about your body. And if your body has been altered, a degree is a very significant amount in terms of body temperature. A difference between 97.6 and 98.6 is quite dramatic in terms of its effect on the body, or at least starts to be. But most certainly when you get down to 96 degrees or 95 degrees, uh, you have a, a very big issue at play. And that issue is on board with us if, you would, if you'd be willing to do the study. All right. I... Um, in the paper, in the transcript I gave you, I showed you the uh, toxicity effects of the protein. I won't go into it. Uh, I told you that it was alarming. Enough said at this point with our time. All right. The next part of this. I, in the past, do really do not talk about my personal situation um, because that's not sufficient. Uh, to justify, let's call, uh, making a scientific case to persuade uh, a group. But we're at the stage now where the scientific information is available. If anyone wishes to look at it, it's, it's ample, it's abundant, and it's compelling. It's appropriate for me at this time to add some additional observations that I have um, that I have established over a period of several years, and I am a part of that study. Okay? In a sense, uh, I have become a subject of my own research in various ways. Uh, I can tell you I, I monitor my blood, I monitor my urine on a regular basis. Um, there's no secret to me what's happening inside the body of many people. I put the phrase on here, it says, personal objective sustained studies and trials. It's true, I'm, I try to be pretty fair, I study things. And uh, the casual world, if they first uh, see the things we're talking about, they'll say, oh, this is science fiction. You, you know, you're talking about microbiology. But it's not science fiction. Everything that I speak of is evidence-based. We have to get through these uh, quickly, but these are things that are going on in the body that are, a direct result of the existence of this microbe. I already mentioned the survey. I already asked whether or not you might think about your own experience in, in any association or relationship to that symptom list. Let's go through these. I, I have evidence. I know from a personal basis that this organism, this microbe does the following. It creates uh, nodes in the body, uh, central locations, okay, where it uh, seeks uh, harbors. It uh, basically it says, hey, this is a place that's good for me to, to uh, metabolize and develop my little network. And I will say that it ties in with, uh, it picks ner neural points, ner nerve centers um, to work with. Nerve, nerve centers and joints are major points of operation here. I know that this microbe responds to stimuli. Okay. I know that this microbe exhibits motion within the body. These are some of the examples of the type of stimuli that can produce that. Uh, these are all fascinating discussions we could have. I'm told I need to be brief. I'm not a brief person in general, so I have to just mention them. But I'm telling you that the body of work will all make the case for all of this, or my laboratory notebooks, which are a big part of things, will substantiate it further. And my knowledge, should anyone ever uh, care to engage, um, could share uh, some of the, uh, the direct evidence for this. Nothing here is casual. Next, this micro produces biofilm. That's uh, pretty common in the microbial world. It's a form of protection. Preservation, very effective one too, by the way. Very difficult to imagine getting rid of. Um, major body fluids systematically examined for changes over a period of years. I just mentioned that. Quorum sensing, quorum sensing location triggers. There is, an ability, there is an ability of communication that takes place within this microbe in the body. Uh, it has the means to um, uh, trigger and alter lo you know, uh, where it is going to be more active in the body. If something gets worked on for a while, which I'll talk about on the second section, it can trigger it in a, another section of the body. There is a form of communication that takes place. This form sensing is something well-established in the bacterial world. Uh, you recall my nomenclature, there's 
You can't uh, get away with calling it a straight bacteria at this point, but you can use that as a starting or reference point. There are certainly many bacterial qualities in the microbe. So the ability of communication is, is really a very important issue when you start thinking about the idea of uh, networking of information. And if you recall that blood slide that I showed you, that's an extraordinary thing that's taking place there of having geometric, basically, organization uh, going on. And what does this actually mean? I would refer and suggest you take a look at that paper called Transformation of a Species uh, to basically uh, bring a few questions to the surface. Uh, survivability intelligence. You know, intelligence is an interesting word. I once had uh, one of my bosses when I was uh, early on the employee scene, a boss made an interesting statement. He said, yeah, Clifford, what do you think intelligence is? And, he, and uh, we sort of tossed around a little bit and he said, you know, I think, I think it means adaptability. I think intelligence is about adaptability. And that statement has always stuck with me since I was uh, 20 years old. Because um, intelligence is in the eye of the beholder in a lot of ways, and we happen to think we're the beholders. But uh, if you want to think about intelligence in terms of adaptability and survivability, um, there, is an, uh, there is a factor here that you might want to be considered. Um, the, the ability of this particular microbe to survive in what I would call adverse or hostile uh, circumstances that might include outside of this or this atmosphere is absolutely extraordinary. Um, the ability to be dormant for extended period of times is quite evident. So there are questions about uh, what does it mean in terms of the ability to survive under, um, under differing conditions or extreme conditions. There's going to be questions longer term. They're not really, they're not really answerable yet, I don't think. Uh, about the balance and, and relationships between parasitic and symbiotic relationships. Um, it would be easier at this stage to characterize things as a uh, parasitic arrangement, I think. However, when uh, you were witness to that blood example, of which I ran into two examples like that, they were most extraordinary, um, the idea of maintaining the integrity of that cell um, and meaning that those cells are still able to function. There was no obvious ill health uh, stages uh, with those particular individuals. It doesn't mean there wasn't an issue. There probably were a whole series of issues that were quite abundant if you cared to look at them. But there, the, that paper called Transformation of a Species will raise some questions for us. And in the long term, in the long term, uh, there may be some of an alteration of the interpretation of the existence of the species in a symbiotic or a parasitic relationship. I will say at this point, this microbe is here to stay. This is not something you're getting rid of. It's in our interest uh, to learn about uh, how this is altering biology in the world. All right, here is a statement um, that uh, brings up uh, some of the reason that we're here. And that is, I, I consider the pr professions of the world to have a set of ethics. And these ethics underlie the very existence of those professions. And one of the many professions that is on the table here is that of the health and medical professions. And if you have a situation where the health and medical communities do not uh, acknowledge the existence of a, of a specific microbe that produces significant specific effects upon the body, easily, easily um, identifiable and controllable and repeatable to a reasonable level in the laboratory settings. And you have the refusal of those professions to, to acknowledge and accept that existence. Now you are imposing risk to, quote, your patient. You are posing, you are creating an unnecessary risk to the general population if you refuse to treat them and you refuse to help them. So we are entering into this other territory of this discussion about the refusal to acknowledge and investigate that which exists. Remember the EPA failure and the consequences of that are now still very much with us and they're part of the reason that we're here today. You are now imposing a risk 
And you are definitely not fulfilling the ethics of the profession if you choose that path. Let me move on. Um, I've got actually some kind of timer here to see that I don't get totally out of bound. I've told many people I'm not a soundbite person. All right. This is another area. Now, this information, again, um, I haven't disclosed this, some of this information, most of it actually, um, for a variety of reasons, mostly of which I just spoke about. If, if the uh, professionals do not accept and exercise their responsibility, we've created a really serious problem. And that's what the opening lines there are about, okay? These, these are topics that potentially could be a benefit if they get in the hands of people that are willing to investigate this issue uh, to help people. These are some suggestions from one person, one person, namely me, that has been involved in trying to research what is the nature of this microbe and its impact upon biology, the planet, and the human being, and really all life in the end. So read the lines because it needs to be expressly stated that this is a situation. This information is it's informational and research-based only. There is absolutely no diagnostic or therapeutic basis provided with what I'm saying here. And professional health consultation is mandatory. To, to even begin to consider the use of this information, professional health consultation is mandatory. But the catch-22 is if the professional health communities will not acknowledge the existence of something that is directly observable in all simple ways. Well, now you have a problem because now you, you're you refusing to help people, but yet your your help is required. So that's the dilemma. That's the dilemma the world is now facing. The help is required, but it's being refused, okay, by the very person, the very people that that are embedded into a set of ethics that dates back centuries. But that is their purpose. Hippocratic oath, right? Okay, so let's go through this. The first suggestion would be for, for those that wish to be familiar with and aware of a paper that I wrote, the title of it is called Morgellons of Supplemental Discussion. That paper basically lists about uh, two dozen uh, primarily nutritional approaches uh, that may be of assistance in assisting the body to develop its own immune, you know, in increase the strength of its immune system and counteract some of the effects that are taking place with this microbes existence. And that, pa that paper had its origin in another paper that took a year and a quarter to write, a 125-page paper called A Working Hypothesis. So that's the place to start. I, and you'll find my disclaimer on just about every paper there is. There's nobody trying to give personal advice here as to what to do. I am saying the professionals need to do their job. That's what I'm saying and have always been saying. It's not my role. You know, that's that's what that's why people train themselves. That's why they spend years of their life is to be able to help people, you know, not call them nuts or crazy. That's crazy. OK, number two, we're getting into some new territory and it's absolutely essential that everything I say here be acknowledged, at least witnessed and accepted, because this information that I'm presenting right now is being addressed to the professional community. This is not being directed to the general public community. I, I have already said there is a role and an obligation that must take place here. I have a scientific uh, obligation to release information that resulted from honest, open research and is not uh, attaining the disclosure that it requires. I have that obligation. So I'm coming from a scientific standpoint. Number two, there is evidence, strong evidence to indicate that the application of ultrasound technology in a judicious manner, sustained manner, careful manner, can be beneficial uh, towards, uh, let's say, at the very least, uh, disrupting 
disrupting the ability of this microbe to form the networks and nodes that I'm speaking of. That's the fact. You can see the qualifiers there, personal trial information only. Here's one for you. Uh, it is observed that with the use of ultrasound at these nodal centers, by the way, which are really only detected, the only easy way to detect them is with ultrasound. They can uh, really not be evident in any kind of way to most people other than you might think you have a sore joint or something like that. Ultrasound will reveal the location of these uh, nodal centers. Uh, it is of interest to me that there, there is a pain tolerance that happens with ultrasound, if you're familiar with that to some degree. And um, it's, it's interesting to me that the pain threshold of the human body appears to be somewhat commensurate with the ability of the micro uh, to sustain that same energy level before there is a uh, let's, uh, a more successful, let's say, dispersal of that uh, internal biofilm uh, filament uh, microbial network. Proteins also in there. Okay, that's an interesting observation. It has a potential uh, beneficial aspect to it, I suppose. Certainly, as a monitoring device. The time period that I'm speaking of with the application of ultrasound technology can involve anywhere from days to weeks to months to years. Conceivably, it may be a lifelong enterprise. It's possible. I've talked to you about the ability of the microbe to uh, relocate, to migrate uh, within the body to basically regroup and say, hey, what's, uh, you know, what's the next most vulnerable part of the body? You'll find that uh, one will find that uh, previous injury sites or places of known uh, history with some kind of uh, physical issue might be a target uh, for the nodal center to form. Um, but conceivably, it may be a long-term venture in life. But uh, nevertheless, I am claiming that there is uh, evidence of, of benefit there. Um, okay, the C, the last one on here, is extremely important. It's, it's really, uh, in large part, what what prompted me to call this meeting. I want the professionals of, of the world to accept their responsibility here. There is potential harm and injury to individuals that take it upon themselves to investigate the use of ultrasound technology without assistance. That's a statement of fact. And it would be neg negligent um, and potentially very harmful to encourage, to encourage any kind of use of ultrasound without the medical community's direct participation, supervision, or a consultation, or at least accessibility. Number three, aromatic chemistry is interesting here. Oh, and by the way, there are certain advantages there that are listed for ultrasound. You know, we tend to go for the multi-million dollar machines right now in uh, the way we approach medicine. Ultrasound has a long history. It's actually uh, would be fairly affordable overall. Uh, some advantages, internal, non-invasive, non-destructive, widespread therapeutic acceptance, especially if you look at its history. Uh, also from an imaging standpoint, another whole line, uh, internal imaging. Okay, aromatic chemistry, another field of interest here um, that I pose to the uh, communities to investigate. This one is more on the external side. If it, uh, it seems like it has applications um, basically on the skin. Um, and uh, there are particular chemical compounds that are showing themselves to be uh, potentially beneficial. It's not a surprise to me, um, actually. Uh, these things make perfect sense if you're dealing with a, a, a chemical and, and an energy source. It's not an unreasonable claim to say or think that you might be able to disrupt uh, the ability of a particular microbe to form, do its normal thing. Um, uh, but even the chemistry of the microbe itself has interesting ties here in aromatics. But I'll mention these uh, particular uh, compounds. Uh, methyl salicylate uh, comes from wintergreen, uh, menthol mint. Uh, melaleuca is not an aromatic, uh, but very interesting chemistry on the melaleuca going on. That one is has been subject to less 
testing. Uh, but basically, if you're talking about the development of a balm or an ointment here. Uh, it, this is in the world of liniments, is what it is. Um, but uh, the aromatics are showing indications of being able, on a more surface level, uh, to disrupt the uh, formation of the networks, particularly particularly if the networks are more superficial. Um, you know, this business about whether it takes months to work on things or even years versus if you see, like if you saw a pattern of migration um, within uh, days or so, that might indicate it's a more superficial nature. Okay, I have, think I've mentioned it, but uh, it's very, it's actually very easy for those that uh, wish to... Um, uh, substantiate, that's what I'm speaking of, is to look at blood and urine samples under a decent microscope. Decent microscope here, we need to be running at roughly 5,000 uh, power with a, enough resolution to justify that. Uh, three would be the absolute lowest, 3,000 would be the absolute lowest I would go. 5,000 seems to be a workable number and five to 10,000 is, is even better. Uh, but the existence of the microbe uh, can be uh, monitored and followed with that kind of simple tool. You'll notice how seldom anybody actually looks at anything under a microscope anymore. We're dealing with machines to have program tests in them for detection. But it can be, and sometimes can even be in a visual nature, particularly in terms of the formation of the, of the filament networks. Um, it, it can reach a point where it simply is uh, seen um, uh, visually, and you sure is better hope that you're seeing that visually in the urine more than the blood. I've seen both. Um, okay, that's the end of this section. In this final section, I'd like to uh, give you information on how to access uh, the information that we have spoken of uh, within this presentation. I'll get a screen share started. I'll try to keep this fairly brief, but this will be the place where the information actually resides. Okay, the website uh, is carnicuminstitute.org. You'll see it right here. Carnicuminstitute.org is, is the website. This is not the only place where you will be able to access the in, information. The website does exist. The goal of uh, this portion of the project is a public decentralized international, oops, spelling there, <laughs> public decentralized international release of all technical information, including intellectual property developed by Carnicum Institute. So this will include all the research papers, all of the laboratory notebooks and index to the research papers and index to the laboratory notebooks uh, and the transcript, Santa Fe conference transcript, and the library of infrared uh, spectroscopy data. There are four levels of access uh, that have been established for you over the last couple of years uh, with uh, extraordinary really efforts by a, a volunteer. Um, the only reason that the information was available in a more convenient fashion uh, was because of this volunteer effort. We're now at a point where there are changes that take place and we need to shift the information to um, sort of a maintenance-free environment. And also uh, with long-term interests uh, at hand that are not tied into the current uh, censorship uh, activities that are taking place. So the four levels are the the website itself, which I've given you the URL of carnicuminstitute.org. A site called archive.org is a excellent uh, library of information across the world over uh, his, over time. And Carnicum Institute is, is deeply uh, integrated into that website now. What is called the torrent network is another level of preservation and protection of this information. And the last is what is called a dark web. I'm less familiar technically with these uh, two areas, uh, but uh, they are available for those that understand it. If you're having a hard time getting the information, you dig down deeper into the 
you know, the hierarchy where the information is preserved. I think it would be very difficult right now to remove the information as it has already been entrenched unless we have a major operation where an entire, uh, entire internet infrastructure is, is turned off or switched off. These are examples of uh, what you will see when you go to these places. Um, this is a uh, an index file for the research papers covering in 20 years. This listing is probably about 20 pages long and covers the 350 plus research papers that exist. The next is an example of the index of the laboratory notebooks. This was just recently completed. The uh, index is sorted in two different ways. One is by topic and the other is by volume. So if you need to find a particular subject, you can cross-reference the likely many volumes uh, that will be um, uh, referenced for any particular topic. And you can also view the work chronologically in the, um, in the volume sort. And so that's a couple of examples of what that looks like. And the last is a single page from probably 4,000 pages of handwritten notes. Uh, which were, again, never intended to be released, at least for, for my own use. But for some of the reasons described, uh, this information has all, uh, has all been released. And uh, this includes especially the very recent information it will be in volumes 23 through 25, which is completely unpublished work. And it's where a great deal of the intellectual property resides and where many significant advances took place within uh, culturing uh, biomolecule separation and DNA extraction. Okay, so that's uh, where you go and what it looks like if you go there. I'll give you a very quick example of what that is in real life. This is the website and you'll see that Let's go ahead and go to the actual homepage. Hopefully that'll show up. Um, but nevertheless, you will find uh, links on here for the research papers. You will find links on here. Here we go. Research papers and what that looks like. Again, the website is all structured towards downloading. Now, it's not a reading environment. It's not a search environment. The capability simply does not exist anymore. Uh, this portal exists to give you the information and to encourage you to download it and help in its distribution in a censorship-free environment. You'll see the papers are listed by year. All the papers for one year are in a single PDF. You will also find that index file at the very top of this listing, a short file right up here is the uh, index file. All the papers will be listed there. Same type of thing will go for the laboratory notebooks. Um, all the volumes will be listed, volumes one through 25 and see to get there you will click on this oh notice also while we're here the infrared infrared data is listed beneath it um, it's about 1500 spectra that were collected on uh, various samples over the years of work the notebooks will be listed in this type of form here you'll see the the topic sort and the volume sort indices at the top here and then you'll see the actual notebooks uh, I would emphasize volumes 23 through 25 are going to be very important as mentioned for the more recent unpublished work. And also, let's see if I can fix this up or not. The, oh, the, the video, the video library, libraries on here also. The Morgellons Research Project, the survey data that I spoke of, that's on there. And, You'll find a link to the torrent index on here if a person needed to go deeper into the distributed network across the globe, if you're having a hard time getting this. We have to look long term here uh, and anticipate what might occur uh, with uh, loss of information or alteration of information.
And with that, I'm going to see if I can bring there. There we are back. And I want to thank all of you for your time in this presentation. And I'm going to try to help out in any way that I can afterwards. So thank, thank you very much. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That was uh, the short video, 70-minute video that Clifford Carnicom has put together. Is just kind of a general overview of the work that he's been doing for the last two decades. Uh, it's pretty amazing. He's been working on this since 1999. Uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit more of the backstory here so you can put it into the, a larger context. Um, you know, 1999, he basically sees some chemtrails coming over the property, and he's wondering what's going on. He starts to do some analyzation of some uh, environmental samples, and he comes across these these bizarre fibers. Uh, he sends them he sends them off to the federal agencies to say, "What the heck is this stuff?" Uh, and he gets no response, as you heard in the video. Uh, and that has continued with zero response other than a brief period of time where a few uh, tests were run, discovered a strange polymer substance, and then didn't look into the proteins. Discovered the new protein, but didn't look into what that protein was. That's, that's the million-dollar question. That's what uh, Carnicom is trying to find out here. Uh, what, what are these unique protein sequences that are finding their ways into our bodies? And then in some people... As he later discovered, uh, these multiply and become apparently what is now known as Morgellons disease, which is all these strange fibrous wires, wire-like substances that start to grow uh, under people's skins and sometimes starts to poke out, very painful, uh, as he's described to me, a lot of these people are on the verge of death. They're coming to him uh, trying to ask questions, trying to get somebody to listen to what they're talking about. The federal agencies simply describe it as psychosomatic. You must be making it up. Uh, there's nothing to see here. Move along. Uh, when Clifford, with his 20 years of experience and 300 plus research papers, has a lot of questions for these guys and, and really could use the access to uh, the, the better labs and the more experienced professionals that are working at these federal agencies, but they're not coming forth to help these Morgellons patients in any way. Um, so Clifford's been doing this by himself for quite a long time, and he doesn't really engage in a lot of speculation as to what's going on. Um, my experience with him so far has been that he seems um, very committed to the science, and he doesn't want to make any kind of speculative statements that may or may not end up being true once he can analyze this all the way to the end. I mean, the story really has, there's more work to be done, especially in terms of sequencing the DNA of this cross-domain bacteria that he's found. Um, but, you know, from my perspective, I think this could be a pretty big story. Um, we have heard a lot in this movement about something called transhumanism, uh, and there's been a lot coming out in, in the news, especially related to uh, COVID with the new mRNA vaccines that are coming out and the DNA vaccines that they've been working on that can actually change us uh, on a genetic level. And you have to wonder if there is a larger, uh, more organized effort afoot here, maybe to create a platform inside of our bodies for some kind of a transhumanist upgrade. Um, it sounds crazy at first, but uh, with a little bit of research, you can find out that DARPA has been working on this stuff for decades. They've been looking into trying to create super soldiers. They do use these kinds of polymer materials uh, when it comes to some of the science that they've been working on uh, in terms of brain machine interface technology. So, you know, is it conceivable? that this kind of biotechnology may be being used to prepare human beings for some kind of uplink uh, into uh, the cloud or onto the web where we can all be interlinked uh, electronically uh, and maybe even controlled somewhat through microwave technology. I mean, this is a pretty big story, potentially. Clifford doesn't like to go so far into the realm of speculation, but I'm just going to take a few minutes uh, during the outro of his video here to say that potentially uh, this is a very big story. Uh, and so what Clifford wants to do now is set up the Carnicom Foundation, 
where he can get a little bit more money. And I think especially getting groups of experts together that really want to take a look at this stuff uh, and really kind of analyze it to see exactly what is going on. We need to get this DNA that Clifford's isolated sequenced so we can really kind of get an understanding of the kind of organism that we're dealing with here. So uh, I hope you got a lot of information out of this video and there is the 72 page document that will be um, posted in the show notes. I urge everyone to try to check those out. And if you're interested, uh, certainly go to the carnicominstitute.org and check out uh, a lot of the research papers there. I think if you read the 72 page document, it's a good start. Uh, there's a number of papers that are cited in there. You can go to the website, check out the papers, dive a little bit deeper into this, see what you think is going on. And um, if you are a professional, a scientist, or you have any interest in helping out uh, with the development of the, uh, of the foundation, of helping to take some of this work to the next level, uh, or if you're just a concerned citizen who wants to make a donation, then please go to the website and you can contact Clifford Carnicom. Uh, through the website there. I do think this information is important. We've got two roundtable discussions uh, with some experts uh, in the panel coming up. Um, we're gonna, probably going to release them just in the next week or two so you can see the conversations that have happened when we do get some professionals together who are curious about what's really going on here, uh, asking Clifford some questions. We had some great back and forth, so we'll be producing those. Um, and they'll be out here very shortly. And then the whole thing will be kind of one big package. It's about six hours worth of material. So uh, stay tuned for all of that. And we're going to hope to continue to bring you more information as this story grows. Uh, really want to thank Clifford Carnicom for the decades of work, actually, that he's put into this, but also for choosing Transparent Media Truth as his outlet to get this story out. Uh, we're very happy to be helping him with that. So stay tuned again for the next two roundtables. I've been your host. My name is Doug McKenty. You can check out my weekly podcast, The Shift with Doug McKenty, on YouTube uh, and on Facebook. And I am on the web at www.theshiftnow.com. And, of course, I'd like to thank Rob Rubin uh, of Transparent Media Truth. Find out, uh, find this video and all the other roundtables that we've done at www.transparentmediatruth.com. And you can contact Rob via Twitter at transparent med1 so i urge all of you to do that get in touch with us get in touch with clifford if you're interested in learning more and we will be getting more information to you in the very near future thanks everyone for listening and uh again we'll keep you uh, appraised of this situation as it develops all right take care The opinions and ideas expressed in this roundtable discussion do not necessarily reflect the views of Transparent Media Truth, but only those of the speakers participating in the discussion. Under the Copyright Disclaimer within Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowances are made for fair use of public content for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use.